time once again for the Post-Prison Education Program radio show. And we are joined here live in the KODX studios by Ari Cohn, uh, Shalisha Hudson, and Vincent Gronross. And going to be talking about the uh, several issues, but main, mainly focusing on community of origin. County of origin. County of origin. Sorry about that. So, uh, Ari, why don't you take it away? Thanks, Mike. Um, I think a, a lot of – I think it would be good to just talk about the history of this because I think what the legislature did was um, deceitful at best and uh, talk, uh, talk about who in the Washington State Legislature in 2007 was in that group that caused this piece of legislation to come into law, which is causing people to recidivate, be readmitted to prison, die, um, in really alarming numbers. And um, it was the Pierce County delegation. So for listeners, if you were a member of the Washington State Legislature, in 2007, as far as, <clears throat> as, far as I'm concerned, you're responsible for deaths, for people dying. Um, so what, what happened, uh, so everybody has the background is in 2005, the legislature, uh, passed a bill, Senate bill 6308 that created a, a task force and the, uh, task force purpose was to reduce recidivism. And, and I'm going to interrupt myself because I think one of the sad things that I've seen the last. 15 years is one ridiculous um, task force or committee or governors fake like we're doing something group or whatever after another, um, all with the declared uh, purpose of reducing recidivism. And they kind of keep repeating themselves. They keep failing. Uh, recidivism keeps climbing, but politicians keep hoodooing the public into believing that they're trying to, to accomplish something. And it's kind of like we talked about at town hall the other day in terms of the biggest lie ever. Um, legislators want the public to believe that recidivism is this mystical, super difficult, uh, unsolvable problem, but they're working on fixing it. Right. And that all is a lie. Uh, every bit of it. So in after 6308 was passed in 2005, that it created a reentry task force that, that went, began work in January of 2006. And it, initially, it was pretty amazing. It was bipartisan. It was chaired by Deb, co-chaired by Debbie Regala, who was the Democrat from the Senate, and Mike Carroll, who was the Republican from the Senate. And uh, legislative staff was assigned to, to work with participants. There were four work groups. There were about 80 of us um, that worked for nine months and, and, and met multiple times a week. Um, and, um, at the end, the, the recommendations of those, uh, of that reentry task force went to governor Gregoire and for the most part, everything that was really good and meaningful got voted down by seven voting members. So like Regala was a voting member, Harold Clark, who was one of the most, probably the most despicable secretary of the department of corrections in its history, um, who I'm thrilled to say I was part of getting him fired. Um, uh, these were the people that were voting members and they voted down the things that would have worked. And, um, uh, and so what, what went to Gregoire wasn't, uh, anything that would reduce recidivism. And to, to, to the point that one of the really good people in that task force was Mary Helen Roberts, who's now retired from the House of Representatives from Linwood. And 
I rem- I was in Olympia on another matter, and I was at the Red Lion Hotel, and um, the bill that led to sixty one fifty seven came out it was 5070 senate bill 5070 and mary helen called me she didn't know i was in town but she called my cell phone and she said have you read this bill yet and i'm like no i've been down here in meetings and i haven't and she said well i don't think it has anything in it that the task force recommended um that was meaningful and and she said i'm thinking about um dropping a bill myself. This was Mary Helen Roberts. And can we get together in the morning? So her schedule and my schedule, we ended up at her office at 7.15 in the morning. Bryn Houghton, who was Adam Klein's uh, legislative aide at the time, was in that meeting. And I'm thinking some representatives from the Quaker lobby and TRRC were also in it. But like 7 o'clock, we met at Mary Helen's bill our office in the House of Representatives, and she uh, decided to to pass a bill that would reflect what was what the task force recommended that hadn't been voted down by these Harold Clarks of the world, and frankly, Debbie Regalas and Mike Carrolls of the world, and uh, so she dropped what I think was the best bill in the history of the Washington State Legislature. It was, it was House Bill 1874. Later in the session, uh, Frank Chop and the Democratic Caucus killed her bill in favor of the Senate's omnibus bill, which was 5070. And, uh, and you can go online to the legislature's website and you can search these things and find them and read them. Uh, but 5070 worked its way through the uh, through the Senate, and I think two people uh, it had bipartisan support, and so it passed over to the House of Representatives. And the important part of this history is it did not have county of origin in it. That language was not in 5070, and that's the deceit. So. Uh, the uh, the Republicans in the House hated that bill, um, and they actually were robo-calling people, uh, legislators, uh, in the middle of the night uh, that were in the House of Representatives telling them, if you support this bill, we'll be in your district spending money and doing everything within our power to keep you from being reelected. And I remember Debbie Regala sent me an email at about 1130 at night, and she just said the robocalls have started. And I, the other thing I remember is Frank Chop was getting phone calls at home from, from new legislators who were scared. You know, they didn't know how politics worked in Olympia, and they didn't know what this meant, and they're being robocalled, and, and these newbies – were panicking and then and then the other people that were worried were people that were in districts where they they barely won election right maybe they won by three percent or two percent or whatever and those were the ones the republicans targeted anyway the Repu- republicans hated that bill it, it made it to the floor of the house of representatives and the republicans hit it with if i remember right 35 amendments and, uh, and all the amendments are listed. If you go to Senate Bill 5070 of 2007, uh, you can read the amendments. And, and what happened was uh, Frank Chop, if I remember right, he was Speaker of the House at the time. He had, I think, seven bills that, he, that had to pass because that was signy die. So if you don't know what signy die is, that's, that's the last day of session by law unless the governor – declares a new session and, and brings the legislature back, that's it. Five o'clock on, on sine die, the session is over it, it, and for the year. And, um, and so he had that deadline, and he, he could have voted down. He could have called up every one of those amendments, and, and the Democrats had the votes to vote them down, but it would have taken all day long. And none of the other bills would have passed. So Chop made 
maybe what was a good decision uh, to let 5070 die. He didn't call it up for a vote. He didn't address the amendments. And 5070 died. So at that point, it's 5 o'clock. The bill, um, 5070, is dead. 6157 didn't really exist except for it was over in Ways and Means under Marguerite Apprentice is just an empty shell. It's almost like with the stock exchange. They used to, you know, pe- public corporations used to, that were authorized to sell stock would sell their assets, and you'd have this empty shell, and then there was a market in the, in the 80s and 90s for these shells. And, sometimes, and, and so 6157 was sort of uh, an empty shell sitting there waiting for somebody to put something in it. And... and Enter the Pierce County delegation, and by the way, Democrats, because Democrats controlled, and and well, not only Democrats, because Mike Carroll was a Republican, and and but for Pierce County, so let's just say the Pierce County delegation, and they were under pressure from Gerald Horn, who was, uh, if he's alive, he can sue me, but as far as I'm concerned, he was an alcoholic, um, hater kind of a prosecuting attorney. And he had been putting a lot of pressure on members of the delegation from Pierce County to the legislature to, to have county of origin language. He was on You can Google him, Gerald with a G, and you can find YouTubes where he's talking about the Department of Corrections making Pierce County be a dumping ground, that more people were being released to Pierce County than came from Pierce County, and he wanted to see that stop. And this guy was uh, maniacal about it, really. And, uh, and, he, and he used fear of people who previously committed sex crimes to, to, to make it a, a be an emotional issue where people's brains turned off and their passions activated. And so I think the long and the short of it is to kowtow to Gerald Horn to get his support, the Pierce County delegation, agreed to put county of origin language into 6157. And, and, that, and that, I guess that came after Jim Hargrove was the chair of the Human Services Committee at, at the time. He's retired now. And he had seen for nine months Mike Carroll and Debbie Regala and, and, and legislative staff and, and, and people like myself and everybody else that worked hard in these four work groups worked their butts off for nine months. I mean, really work hard. You drive from wherever you lived in this state. Tim Bouts was coming all the way over from Walla Walla. Um, and, uh, and, 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 work, and work group meetings, right? About housing, about recidivism, about, about LFOs and so on, and jobs and opportunity. And Hargrove had seen the hard work that went in this, and he didn't want, I was told, he literally specifically didn't want Regala and Mike Carroll's work to be for not. So he and I presumably Lisa Brown, but I don't know, uh, Debbie Regala um, and, and others from Pierce County were involved in just taking the language that was in 5070 and just putting it into 6157, but they added county of origin. And, and, and that's and, – and what's um, – I mean, if you Google the definition of democratic process, you're talking about active participation of citizens. And that didn't happen with county of origin. It did not happen. People, uh, and, and people today, I, you know, you've heard me on the show really um, be critical at best of, of Jeannie Darnell. I, I, it's like, um, and that's really my FCC approved language right uh i mean i if you're responsible for somebody dying and for deaths and increased ever increasing recidivism right then your name ought to be called out and and you and Jeannie, if you listen to this fix it go back and fix the wrong that you were part of in 2007 um but they put this language in and then after five o'clock so the session's over it passed 
I'm using that word loosely, it passed out of the legislature to the governor for signature, having never seen the light of day in any hearing room. It wasn't heard in Ways and Means, Margarita Prentice's committee. It wasn't heard in the House of Representatives committee that oversaw the Department of Corrections. It wasn't heard in Human Services, Hargrove's committee. It wasn't heard anywhere. There was no hearing. There was, there was no discussion. There was no debate. They just picked this language up, put it in, sent it to the governor, and Gregoire signed it into law. And then, and since then, it's been a major problem. The Department of Corrections doesn't like this bill. I mean, if it, it, I, I was, I'm not going to name names, but they, they, um, they, they know it's a problem because it is a problem, and and and, and that that will lead me to uh, why. Uh, Shalisha and I have Vincent Gronross on the, on on the, on the radio show with us tonight. Uh, the bottom line is so simple: if you take somebody who uh, has been to prison multiple times, most of their cases you're going to find, like Vincent's, come from Tri Cities. K- Keith Whiteman from 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 Pierce County. Uh, you know, and so on. And, and, and you see people, and I'm going to use Keith and then Vince will talk about Vincent, but um, you see somebody who's recidivated six times, and it's because they're being released to county of origin. Um, and and uh, where they know all the wrong people, they know all the dealers, they know all the users, they know where they can, somebody will stake them a bag of meth or whatever it is that they can you know, turn into cash, right? And, and, and so putting them back where they know all the wrong people, don't know the right people, have never been on a college campus, don't know anything but one thing, that's what drives recidivism. And that's why, for example, uh, you know, Keith, and one of hundreds of thousands of examples, you know, recidivate, 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 until we get involved and then we go to the Department of Corrections and we work to get a county of origin exception, which and exceptions are spelled out in the legislature, but prisoners don't know about them. And frankly, we found a million times over Department of Corrections line staff in the prisons, they don't know about the exceptions. We keep 100 color copies of 6157 ready to mail out or send to counselors or, or to superintendents saying, hey, this person fits the qualifications for an exception. Don't send them back to their county of origin, for God's sake. They'll die there, or they'll catch another case, and they'll be back in prison at thirty-five thousand four hundred forty dollars a year. Uh, you know, let them let them go to Spokane if that's not their county, or Seattle, or Pierce County, or Bellingham, anywhere but their county of origin. And once we can get somebody's county of origin changed, then you have a good outcome and and i'm gonna just um switch over to vincent but you know the way this always plays out is somebody in the office and with vincent it was shalisha is you know builds a relationship with a prisoner decides that they're worth working for that we should invest in them but they're going to be released to their county of origin. And then uh, somebody bugs me, and then I start talking to the Department of Corrections. And, and, and almost always, since Anna Aylward retired as Assistant Secretary of Community Corrections, and thank God she's gone, I mean, I fought her for five years on county of origin, and didn't really win until Dan Pachoki was promoted to deputy secretary, and then he was a level above her, and he could override her, and he and he started authorizing exceptions for us. Um, but uh, so then we reach out to the Department of Corrections, and invariably, so far since the retirement of Anna Elward, uh, invariably the Department of Corrections has done a phenomenal job working with us to allow these. But for the people who don't know the post-prison education program or the people who hit us when we're so broke we can't breathe, uh, and uh, they end up back at their county of origin. 
you know, right in in a, in the mess with drugs and addiction, and very quickly are catching new cases and on the way back to prison. Um, it's just uh, so. So Vincent came out when uh, September twenty eighth. I came out, and um, we worked with the Department of Corrections to get a county of origin exception to Seattle, and I'm going to let you guys take it from here. You might want to, if you want to, like, introduce him and talk about what transpired before he released, or Shalisha, or... or. Um, yeah, I can do that. So, um, Vincent had applied for a program uh, prior to going back to prison. Um, I received his application. He called our office and was interested in following up with the program. Um, I told him that I talked to Ari about it and I told him that he needed to rewrite a personal statement um, and tell us what went wrong and what was going to be different this time. So he sent us in the personal statement. And after we received that, I was able to start working with Vincent one on one, um, helping him get prepared to go to school um, through this process. It was how many months do you think it was? It's probably about five months. So within the five months, you know, we began building a relationship. Um, I was able to just share the things that I was going through and the things that I was accomplishing to him and letting him know like the opportunities that were out there um, because he didn't know, he didn't know the process. He, and so he would call the office and I'd tell him about scholarships that I got. And, um, you know, he was super engaged. He was really interested. He was calling the office all the time to the point I was getting frustrated, <laughs> um, you know? Um, and so uh, I started, I, um, this was around the time we had Marla and McKenna, the two interns um, from the Seattle Academy. And so I had them sit down and read his first personal statement and then had them read his new personal statement and the letters of recommendations from the your, the teacher he was ta for. And just really look over his whole file. I had um, another student of ours, Tristan, go over it and um, had each of them grade it and see where like grade him on a, a scoring grid to see if they thought he was a good fit for a program and if we should hold a scholarship committee interview. Um, I think though, with as much as he stayed in contact with our program and as much as he pushed to like make sure he was heard, um, there was no way he was not going to get a scholarship committee interview. Um, I know that he, you know, we would just talk about a lot of things. Um, he expressed how he didn't want to go back to his county, that he would end up back in prison and he would go back to what he knew. And so I kind of at that point could see the dedication. He was putting in the footwork to show us that he wanted something different and he just needed the help. And that was something he wasn't used to doing was asking for help. And so at that time I reached out to Ari and I told Ari, you know, like this guy's calling all the time. He's showing an effort that he really wants to change and he wants help and he's willing to do whatever. And so um, we got the scholarship committee interview. We went out, we interviewed um, Vincent. It was a hassle to get him interviewed. Um, it was a process, but we got through that. Um, and, you know, it was, there was no question about it. Like he was in our program. Um, just the dedication and everything showed that he wanted something different and he just needed that help and he needed that guidance and he needed to have someone who believed in him. And that's where we stepped in. Yeah. And uh, that, 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 that's, some, that's so true about this program. Uh, Cause before it, before I even heard about it, I mean, going to prison three times and, doing about nine years of my time locked up 31 years old now and uh all i knew was was the streets every time that i gotten out before this last time it was 40 dollars gate money a white tee a pair of khakis and go fam for yourself and all i knew was just like ari said it's i have no place i have no house all i could do was go to a dealer go pick up a bunch of dope and start committing crimes. That was the only way that I knew how to survive. I didn't have any positive influence out in that area. And the second time back to prison, I mean, with, with a six-year chunk from uh, stealing a bunch of weed, I mean, just doing stuff where I, I, sh I should have been dead. Uh, my mom was afraid. She was afraid for her life. She almost died from a heart attack uh, when she heard how much time I got. And she was scared that I was gonna have to come back to Tri-Cities. She was begging, can you find anywhere? Can you go to Se Seattle? Can you go to Spokane? Can you go here? Can you go there? And that county of origin law was so hard that you had to have a family member, someone that you knew that would sponsor you. 
And and who's going to sponsor a dope dealer? Who's going to sponsor a guy that, that's got robberies and, and burgs? And I'm talking like just an insane amount of crimes on my record that the, at, at face value, you might say, oh, this guy's got glasses, always oh, cool. But then when I tell you everything, they back up. And it, it gets down to that impending doom like, okay, cool, I got three meals in prison, but how are you guys going to help me get out? I'm going to get out with nothing. I got all these people that got cars, they got licenses. I got a prison ID and I got to go try to find a job and I got to go try to find a house and I got to go try to try to pay my bills so I don't get thrown in for LFOs. And I mean, it, it was, it was a never ending cycle. And this last time, not this time, but the time before I had had post prison come into the prisons. And I mean, it, they were raw. They were getting up and, and DOC staff was trying to calm them down and they're like, you can't say that. And they're like, no, we're going to say it. We're, we're, th this is the answer. And, I, and I, I'm not saying this because anybody told me, but I mean, for the first time in my life, I had a glimmer of hope and I had that fire and I was getting ready to get out and, and the program was telling me, call me, we'll come down to the work release, we'll come pick you up. But I had a slip up in there. Not saying that, that everything's good in prison. I mean, you can find bad stuff in there, too. And, and next thing you know, I had lost contact. I got back out. I was supposed to call them the day I got out. I didn't. And I went back to working a job. And that wasn't enough money to pay my bills. And I went right back into it. And within three months, I was locked back up. And le le like they were saying, I called again. And I said, hey, I'm back. And there's that recidivism. But... I wanted a new way of life. I didn't know how, I didn't know what, but this wasn't working. And it was time to be loud. It was time to just, no bars, help me, help me get out of here. And they fought tooth and nail, like they were saying for five months. I was calling the office. I was saying, hey, these, these guys at, at Airway Heights Institution, they don't know nothing about this program. They only care about Spokane Community College and that's it. But you got a prison full of guys that are going to all these different counties, but you only want to help one specific group, that doesn't make any sense to me. We're people too. We don't just have a number like, like, like cattle getting ready to go in for slaughter. We want, we want a chance at life too. And post-prison, they said, man, this is a whole new, another chapter in your life. We need another, we need another statement from you. But our, quali our qualifier on that was, was, not only that we wanted to rewrite his application because we wanted to know what would be different this time than last time, but was, was that we probably wouldn't have supported him if county of origin had not, if exception hadn't been issued. You know, somebody with, with the history that Vincent had, we wanted him in Pierce County, Snohomish, King. We wanted him fairly close. And we would have worked with him in Spokane or Whatcom, for that matter. But we dang, I'm sure, weren't going to work with him if he was back at, at his county of origin because, because the, 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 we knew what would happen. And, I, I, and so the, a, key, a, a really key thing with us was, was having him not release. We help people all over the state, but, but we don't want you at your county of origin. That's just, you know, that's just stupid. It's stupid to send somebody back in accordance with this law to where they, all their crimes were committed. Put them right back in the hot pan with all the dealers that they know firsthand that are best friends. And, and, and so, so the real thing with, with us was to get the department of corrections to, uh, push through a, a, an exception, which has to start with the, with the line staff at the prison. And we got pushed back there. And then he was pushing, he was pushing us for a housing commitment because the DOC was going to release him into nothingness. Look, take that literally. I mean, and, and I mean, no job, no housing, no groceries, no money, no nothing. Right. And they did release him. And into they nothing. did release him into nothingness. Yeah. And, and so, um, we, we went, I, I think I got frustrated with line staff. I'm not going to name this lady. And I finally contacted DOC headquarters which um, shouldn't have, have to happen, uh, but often, almost always does when it comes to county of origin. And, and, um, 
And if we, our deal is, I don't want to hammer around on this too long because we only have 30 minutes, but our deal is we're not going to make a financial commitment for somebody we haven't met. And so we wanted to meet Vincent face to face, either Skype for business or in person. And the, in the prison kept this one lady kept, um, just being problematic. That's the putting it kindly and, and, and wasn't helpful setting up a Skype for business interview, even though we've done those with prisons across the state routinely. And before that WebEx and so on. So we finally, I wrote Rob Herzog an email and, uh, I might've, I, I don't, I think it was Rob. I wrote, I might've wrote, written to Daniel Armbruster, but I might've written to Steve Sinclair, but it was one of those three. And, and Rob responded instantly, instantly. Um, I mean, literally within a few minutes and, uh, uh, and he, and he made it happen. So then three of us got in a car and we went to airway Heights and we interviewed Vincent and one other prisoner and worked with a counselor who was amazing and a CPM who's amazing. Um, and a superintendent who was amazing. Um, and, 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 and then we got the County of origin. And again, thanks. To, I want to be really, I want to emphasize this. So like the problem here is not the department of corrections. Just like I said, at town hall the other night, uh, I've got like super close friends that are super adversarial with the department of corrections. Um, and I don't, I don't, and I don't agree. I don't agree with what they believe, and I don't agree with them that the problem is the DOC. In my mind, is everything goes back to the legislature, funding and stupid laws and 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 killer laws like this. But so, so I want to get to uh, the specifics. I want Vincent to get to the specifics. I was uh, amazed when he walked into our office at 4:04 on a Saturday. A couple weekends ago, we stayed late. We were open Saturday, ten to two. We stayed late waiting for him to get in, and he had two dollars in his pocket. So the forty dollars the DOC gave him that morning, it, you know, is he's been on the bus all day long, and and he's had to eat. And and in this world of hot dogs, to ten dollars, it's like you can't buy a candy bar for less than five anymore. And so he arrived in Seattle late in the day, having been on buses from Airway Heights all day long with $2 in his pocket. And if we weren't there, then I want, or, or the same thing would have happened. Well, first of all, if we weren't there, he would have been released to, to tri cities. And so I want, I want you to like, if you can, yeah, as realistically as you can with no fluff and bull and no exaggeration, just like, if you had arrived at noon or one on that Saturday in Tri Cities with two dollars in your pocket, the only clothes what you're wearing, khakis that identify you as having come from a prison, and a box of legal papers. That's what I remember you walking into the office yeah. with. You know, what would have happened? I pro I guarantee you the first thing that I would have done getting off that bus with two dollars in my pocket, I'm looking for a come up. First thing even before explain it and it, 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 it come up what i mean by it is is getting something of value in my pocket to where i can start the barter process all over again i'm going to go into a store i'm looking for a high dollar item two items three items whatever i can get and i'm a runner i i, I was very athletic in high school and i'm going to go in and w within that first hour i'm, I'm already committing my first crime and I'm going to be looking, where can I go to go get rid of this? And going in, into a town where I know everybody, and it's almost like I had to live like a hermit, I would have went straight over to one of my dealer's houses. I would have peddled it to him, and I would have said, hey, dude, I'm out. My mind's right, which is kind of ironic at a dealer's house. Uh, give me some more weight. I need, I need to go make money. And first thing after that is is is... You, you, got, you got to know your product, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to get loaded. I'm going to get into that mindset to where I can numb all the feelings of the screwed up stuff that I'm going to go out there and do and befriend people, and it's going to 
end up leading back to it, it would lead back to me running the ring running the gauntlet i would have been up for weeks on end i would have been going to house to house to house trying to find more stolen product to get rid of find more people to deal to uh try to find people that that in that lifestyle that were making miss moves that i could come up on also uh, that that was one of the major major things that sent me to prison was robbery it's like the drugs wouldn't get me high I was gonna have to go out and I, I lived by that violence of that of that street life and that and that was it was it was almost a rush. It was either gonna be I'm going back to prison, I'm gonna die, or you're gonna retire. But how many dope dealers do you know that retire? I mean when you're out there doing all the bad stuff, it, it, it's it's just a false lie. It's it's like I, I I guarantee you I wouldn't have been in my kid's life right now. I wouldn't have been going to college right now. I wouldn't have been having a job. And shoot, the simple things, like one of the students in the program, I'm able to, to tutor her daughter in math. And, and, and she's, she's like begging, begging for me to come back to the office and do it again. And You're off topic. I want to talk about but county yeah, of origin. But yeah, yeah, county of yeah. origin. So like uh, you send me back to that, 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 that town, there's no public, like positive support. I don't have a group of people that are checking up on me daily are saying, what are you doing? What's going on? Are you struggling with anything? No, I just got people that are saying, hey, can you come over? I need some more of this. Or, hey, can you do that? I wouldn't have had the support that I have here. Go open a bank account. What's that? I didn't know what any of that stuff was. Uh, hey, you need to make a budget. I would have been making a budget. I would have been out there just just doing it. I mean, it would have been a mess. There would have been no structure whatsoever. And for a guy like me with, you would think, why would he even need to smoke that stuff? I guarantee you it would have been. Well, I mean, the thing, you know, the thing is, I, I listen, listening to you, I'm thinking, I don't care if you're Jesus Christ or the rabbi at my synagogue. You're, you get off a bus having been released from a prison and you've got two dollars in your pocket and you're going to get hungry I, I don't care if you're sally bagshaw on city council or who you are or, or dow constantine or the the worthless the, i can't say that so, so, but i don't care <laughs> if you're the governor or whoever you know you get hungry and so, you, so you release. You've got. You don't have a roof over your head. The Department of Corrections, and this again is a legislative issue, released him into to homelessness. A guy with with his criminal record released him into homelessness, right? And with forty dollars, and 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 you know, so you hit the street. Here it was 404. Tri Cities, he would have gotten there earlier in the day from, from Airway Heights, but middle of the day, and you've got two things. You've got to, you want to have dinner. You need something other than prison khakis that identify you as having just released from prison. And you want a roof over your head that night. And, 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 the, and those are impossible tasks given the tools that the legislature has provided to the Department of Corrections to provide to people that are releasing from prison. And, 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 and so, you know, I, I hadn't reread um, 6157 uh, in a while, and I went back and looked at it before I put the post for this radio show up on Facebook yesterday, on my Facebook. And the first sentence of the bill, and I'm going to read it, is... If is an act relating to reducing offender recidivism by increasing access and coordination to services in the communities. That's a lie. I don't know if Jeannie Darnell wrote that or Debbie Regala wrote that or Mike Carroll or Jim Hargrove or Frank Chop or Lisa or who, Brown or Santa Claus. Whoever wrote that wrote one of the biggest lies I've ever read in my life. This whole huge bill, which is a many, many pages, the front first sentence, an act relating to reducing recidivism. 
And then they put a clause in it that starts on the same page. It's the first page of the bill. County of origin is the very beginning of the bill that, that drives recidivism. It's just, it's, it's beyond deceit. It's beyond dishonest. And, and the thing that's makes dishonesty and deceit irrelevant is that people are dying. They really are. They're returning to prison. And if people like, and I'm hammering at Jeannie Darnell, and I should join Roger Goodman into it because he's on the House side in charge of DOC. Um, these are people that could fix this. They could fix this. They could correct this legislation. Roger Goodman had a full-blown hearing during interim two years ago at my request on this issue alone. Um, and, and DOC showed up in force. Anna Elward was leading the banner, uh, and I was there with people from my office and we had a student who County of origin, uh, you know, we had, it had ruined his life many, many, many times, but we, but because we finally got Dan Pachoki on board and Scott Frakes, Scott Frakes, I got Scott on board. Scott got Dan on board, Dan overrode, uh, Anna Elward having for five years blocked this guy's exception and we got him to King County. And so we had him at this hearing, but these people, you know, the committee, Jeannie's committee in, in the Senate, Roger Goodman's public public safety committee. What a laugh. Where's the public safety in sending somebody out of prison after many years to the streets of a community with no food, no housing, no job, nothing. It's, 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 I don't think the word's been invented, but, um, f for what they did, but people are dying. And that's why I'm like, won't shut up about the issue. It's, it's, uh, um, and, and let me just, Shalisha talk about he hits the office and what happened next. I mean, I remember the next, I remember you going to the clothing room and then I remember us going to Red Robin, but just take it through the next couple of days with DSHS and Hampton Inn and, and Oxford house. And Okay. So I am down in the clothing closet and I hear this, someone's walking in and he arrived early. Um, he comes walking in with one of the little plastic containers that you get from DOC. Um, you can order it if you're indigent. Um, with just his paperwork, nothing else. Um, the khaki pants that he got from prison, the white uh, New Balance shoes. Um, we went upstairs, and after that, we all took off from the office. Well, we first had to rent him a room. Um, we rented a room at the Hampton Inn. Um, we went to Northgate, Red Robin, um, sat down. We had dinner. From dinner, we went to the hotel, checked him in. Um, I told him I'd come back in the morning on my way to the office to pick him up because we really needed to find him somewhere to stay. Oh, man. We went to the office that next day. I picked him up when it was checkout time. We went to the office. We sat in there, all three of us, on three different phones, calling every single Oxford house, trying to get him um, into an Oxford house. Finally, I reached out to someone um, in Oxford house, um, called them, told them the situation, how he's from Tri-Cities. He's working with post-prison education program. And my concern was basically just getting him on a couch, just finding him a couch until he could get an interview and get accepted into an Oxford house. The dude I talked to was more than willing to um, allow Vincent to crash on the couch. Um, I drove him, me and Ari drove him over to the Oxford house so that he could be interviewed by the house to see if they would accept him into the house because there was going to be a bed coming open. Uh, I sat outside in the car for about four hours waiting for <laughs> true <laughs> waiting for Vincent to come out um, <laughs> while I'm doing my homework. Um, he forgot I was out there, I think. But yeah. uh <laughs> Finally, he calls me four hours later. Ari goes and gets the check, um, brings the check back, gives it to them, and he takes off. So I'm still sitting there. Um, Vincent calls me. Stop for a minute. I want. I just want to. <laughs> I want to. I want to put some dollars and cents to this. So, so the cost of incarceration is about thirty-five thousand four hundred forty dollars a year, right? And that doesn't count, pros, uh, you know, prosecution and appeals and paying for Dan Satterberg's. Empire downtown and so on and so forth. The Hampton Inn was two hundred six dollars because he called his mom and he ran up the phone bill. So the the hotel to put him to have a roof over his head that night was taxes and and Sunday morning breakfast two hundred six dollars. The Red Robin I saw the bill today because I was working on our tax return sixty dollars right. So that was 
Shalisha, me, and anything Vincent wanted. The biggest hamburger in the history of the world. I insisted it was amazing. dessert, right? <laughs> yeah, it was a and, truffle milkshake. Yeah. And then when you get to, and then the next day after he's accepted at the at the Oxford House, they won't take checks, probably because people have bounced checks to him, but for whatever, and they won't take cash. So you got to give them a money order, and it's Saturday night. So I went all I went looking for an ATM, and it, the point is, it's a big deal. Pulled the cash out of uh, uh, out of our scholarship account, and then I went looking for a Seven Eleven to buy a money order, and then back to the Oxford House, and handed knocked on the door and handed him the 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 money order for the deposit and first month's rent. Right now you can. Now pick back. It was up. actually it was it was only for the first week on the couch. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then um so I was in the car, he called and he said that they accepted him into the house. Um so he came out, um, we went and picked up Tristan. We took him to Fred Myers. We he had no undergarments, no hygiene, no food to last him for the night, no blankets, nothing. So we went and I got him. We got him hygiene. Um, we gave him some cash, let him go shopping in Fred Myers. Um he was a little overwhelmed by that. That, that was crazy. So you get a hundred dollar bill. You're in Fred Meyer's, and they tell you to get what you want, and you're like, "Is this a trap?" <laughs> right? Like, I, I'm I'm in a new town. I got this program that's just loving me, and they're like, "Get what you want." I'm like going over for like some discount boxers, and they're like, "No, dude, get some nice stuff." I'm like, "What?" They're like, "What do you want to get grocery wise?" And uh, Ari actually made a comment about it. It's like I shopped like Shalisa the first time. I'm buying commissary stuff. I'm buying like cookies and <laughs> I don't know what to buy. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean this. It, it was a blessing. They did. They they uh, they took me over there, got me my just bare necessities, and said, later on down the road, don't worry about it. We got you. And that's been the craziest thing about this program is is just like having this blind faith belief that right before I got out to getting up here now that I'm so grateful that I had that belief. I'm so grateful for the fire that they have. I'm going to go back to, I'm going to go back to, yes. Okay. So that was Sunday night. Um, and then Monday, so Sunday night when I dropped him off, I told him that I would be back to pick him up on my way to school. Um, I came and picked him up early in the morning, um, took him up to Seattle central community college with me. I, Directed him to the advisors, to the admissions and financial aid department. Told him I was going to class. I got out in 50 minutes and I'd be back. Um, I came down. He worked everything out. He was able to get into class as long as the teachers would sign off on it. Um, I think from there we went down to the off. Or no, from there I took him down to Cami. Um, I reached out to Cami at the Goodwill and explained the situation of how he released here. He had nothing um, and she was able to help him with the gift card to get clothes from the Goodwill. Um, and I think that it was like every day, like for the first couple of days, I would pick him up and I would drive him. He'd wait for me after my, um, afternoon class, my English class. And I'd come walking out and he's like, yeah, I'm on the corner. And I'm thinking like, I didn't say I was going to give you a ride, you know? <laughs> so then, you know, so then finally, finally, I kind of just kind of let him get in my car and then I just drop him off downtown, um, and kind of help him show him where the buses were so that he could learn how to catch the bus because I wasn't his personal taxi, you know, like. The yeah. first couple of days I did, I did help navigate him and I did, you know, assist him in that. But then I was like, okay, now it's time to let him go, you know. But, um, yeah, so I think those were the first couple of days that he got well, we here. Put a, we put a Google phone in his hand, which he has, unlimited text data, because we have to be able, if we're going to invest in somebody, we're going to be able to talk to him. And you can't live, you can't live anymore without a cell phone. So he cell phone. Gave him a laptop. Gave him a laptop, bus pass told him to go to Ross and buy, buy, buy clothes. And he could, and, and he could have picked out $1,200 worth of clothes, but he, you know, he was like super frugal and I appreciated it. And it was $414, but, um, and, and, you know, today I can't, I hate the, the hour goes so fast. It's, we got 10 minutes left, but you know, today he's, he's, he just paid his rent himself because he's working. Um, He's in school doing exceedingly well at Seattle Central. He goes to meetings with other students and graduates of ours. Um, he's clean and sober. He's building a relationship with his son. Um, he's giving he's back. Well dressed. He's giving back. Uh, 
and um, he's just doing everything right, and it's all the exact opposite of what would have happened if if 6157's county of origin language had had, had been followed and he'd been sent back to Tri Cities, and um, I uh, I'll tell you a quick anecdote, and then I. Uh, it's sad, but it's funny. So, like, the the person that started the, our battle with the Department of Correction. This has been a hell of a battle. I hope that word is okay. A, a, a hell of a battle, really, that just went on for years and years. It didn't get solved until Dan Pachoki was promoted to Deputy Secretary and, and could override Anna Elward. But um, a guy named Mike Hayes who's a sweetheart guy, but he's been to prison like nine times over, over, over County of origin. He comes out to a work release in Tacoma. That's closed now. Right. At rap Lincoln. And he goes to Tacoma community college and does really well. So he, 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 uh, I mean, he has some issues, but he did really well, and he was clean and sober and for six months. And then it's time to release from, from there, and he had maybe the second worst CCO that I've ever met in, the, in, in my history with the Department of Corrections, going back to 2005, was his CCO at Rap Lincoln. And she would not even begin the process for an exception to have him not go back to Tri-Cities. To, to, to Vancouver, not Tri Cities, and so to Clark County. So I, um, Cheryl Strange was deputy secretary of DOC at that time, and um, and I got Cheryl and Pat and Patty Noble Desi, who works at King County now, to send this guy to treatment at DOC cost just to give us time to work out county of origin exception. Try to find a way to get past this absolutely horrendous hater CCO that was at Rat Lincoln. And, um, and, and so they sent him to American Behavioral for 30 days, and then we didn't have county of origin worked out yet, so Cheryl and Patty Noble Dusty worked to extend it, so he was up there at 60 days, at the end of 60 days, we still didn't have county of origin worked at, exception worked out. And I wrote a pretty blistering email to everybody, half the legislature and half, all top DOC people, all, and I predicted what would happen, which is that he would catch a new case if he was released back to county origin, to Jeannie Darnell and Roger Goodman's county of origin. And, and, um, and, and, and that's what happened. He, from Maryway Heights, I mean, from, from American Behavioral in Spokane, he was released back to his county of origin. And they put him in, this is the real, this is the name of the place. The place was called the House of Jesus. That was the name of the transition house. And within one week, Mike and everybody else in the House of Jesus had relocated themselves over to the Clark County Jail, you know, because the house was loaded with drugs. And within a very short time, he, he uh, had new felony cases and new charges and was back in prison. And, and um, then we, and, and then we, um, I got to tell you, I love Dan Pajoki. I wish he was still at DOC. I, 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 a lot of prisoners and former prisoners who knew him looked at him as being a, a hard fill in the blank, really a tough guy. But, um, uh, for us and what we cared about, he was amazing. And, and, uh, so I kept working this issue with Scott Frakes and Scott worked for Dan at the time. So, and, 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 uh, uh, and then Dan got promoted to deputy secretary. And the minute that happened, he picked up the phone and this is like, if you know the Moses and uh, I mean the the Noah story with God and you know Noah's out hoeing in the fields and God tells him to build an ark, right? You know you just don't expect like God to 
to, to call out to line staff. And Dan Pachoki is deputy secretary at DOC headquarters for line staff housing counselor out in the desert at Coyote Ridge was like God calling. And he and Dan literally personally ordered the exception. And, 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 and that broke the cycle, right? So, um, but for five years, uh, we, we fought it. And, you know, I asked you if I could, the FCC would shoot us all if I used a hole without the abbreviation. And you said, I can't do it. But just for the listeners, fill in the two blanks, right? And it, it, at some point, I got so frustrated. I knew, I knew Eldon, Vale, I knew Anna Elward was on Eldon Vale's Facebook page. So I knew if I tagged, Eldon on a post slamming Anna Elward and people like her at DOC that she would see it. And, and she did. And it happened that the next morning there was a headquarters meeting about my Facebook post and uh, an email went out to all the superintendents. They didn't pull my badge. They just, the superintendents were instructed, don't let him use it. And then, and you can Google this. Just Google Ari Cohn, and you'll see this story about my badge having been suspended. And and and, it, 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 I, and I got media involved, and 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 that was that got fixed. But but the the whole, the the fact that we're spending so much time fighting this horrible piece of legislation is just wrong. And we've been fighting it since for nine years now. I mean literally almost right within a few years of after the bill went into law um and it just needs to be fixed it needs to be fixed prisoners need to not be released to their county of origin that's just dumb effing stupid it's i can't think of anything god gave a crowbar more sense than somebody that would write county of origin into law really truly so um can i yeah that? please okay. i just want to say something about like okay uh working with the students that are calling from the prisons, um, them calling and hearing the frustration in their voice because they're trying to get the county of origin change and their counselors aren't willing to push through the county of origin. Um, I've heard DLC or some counselors right there tell a student, or she wasn't a student of ours, but somebody that I was close with in work release that um, if she pushed for a county origin change, that it would mess up her release date and she would have to stay longer. And the person did not want to go back to her county to the point where she was willing to stay and work release longer um, to do the county of origin change. But what I've seen is some of the staff that don't know what they're doing um, when it comes to county of origin change, they're not willing to start the process because it, they think it's a long process or they don't want to start it because it's too much. It's more work than just sending them back to where they're from. But this is a life or death situation for people who are coming out like either they're going to release back to where they're from and either end up going back to prison or they're going to end up dead or you can do the extra work and help them get the county of origin change and help them save their lives you know i i uh, there's a couple quotes i'm wearing a t-shirt that has a martin luther king quote on it it's our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter and then the rabbi who stood by martin luther king at, at the monument in Washington when there was a million people there, uh, Rabbi Prince, he, his, his quotes along the same line, the most urgent, the most disgraceful, the most shameful, and the most tragic problem is silence. So the people that are listening, don't be silent. And, and this, this really matters. Uh, it, so like engage with legislators, uh, do whatever you've got, to get this law changed it's just it really truly is it's costing lives and you know the 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 sad thing and then we're down to the last minute is going back to this language in 6157 uh, an act relating to reducing offender recidivism um when that bill was passed into law recidivism was 28 percent right and and it's increased now. I did. I should have looked today, but it's steadily increased since then. And the last time I looked, it was around 33 percent. And then 2000, and we got we're, we're done. So we got to quit at seven o'clock. But it's a horrible law. People are dying. It needs to be fixed. And do you believe it could be um, if the will was there, it could be fixed this upcoming session, legislative session? Yeah. If the if the will was there, yes. Uh, but it, it it's going to take 
people moving Jeannie Darnielle and Roger Goodman's and Tim Ormsby's of the world uh, to, to, to doing it. They've got to do it. Sonia Hallam in the governor's office has to be supportive of it. Inslee has to, to be supportive of it. And since we've gone over and I seem to be getting along with it, I mean, if Inslee cares about his Department of Corrections not having an ever increasing, nonstop increasing rates of recidivism and ridiculously high numbers of deaths within two years of release, then he should be a driving force behind changing this law. Maybe he could even fix it with executive order. All right, we're going to have to wrap it up there. You've just been listening to the Post-Prison Education Program radio show uh, with Ari Cohn, the founder of the Post-Prison Education Program, Shalisha Hudson, who's with the program, and Vincent Gronross, also with the program. And we'll be back next month. At least one of you will. (laughs) First Thursday of the month. So looking forward to that. So thanks, everybody, for coming in tonight. Thank you, Mike.